Well, last Tuesday, an earthquake hit Jamaica, off the coast of Jamaica. It was a 7.7 magnitude earthquake. And it was felt in Miami, over 500 miles away. And the nature of earthquakes is there's an epicenter, but then it reverberates out from that epicenter and affects those around it and trickles or ripples out, if you will, to the surrounding region. Well, here in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, I've called this earth shake because Jesus is standing, actually it's called Mount Olivet, chapter, excuse me, verse 12, you see there, they're on the Mount Olivet. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives here, and there have been tremors coming from the Mount of Olives throughout biblical history into the ministry of Jesus. I mean, the, the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was betrayed was there. His triumphal entrance came out of there. This is the mountain where Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept over them because of their unrepentance. This is the mountain where Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse. And here is the final place where Jesus now stands on the earth, on this mountain, calling his disciples together before he's lifted to heaven. And three earth shakes converge at once and ripple out not only in the book of Acts, but throughout the entire world and continue to reverberate shockwaves into our lives and into unreached lands because of what happens right here 2,000 years ago on the Mount of Olives. So if you're taking notes, here's the organizing thought for these three shockwaves, if you will. These 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, three earth-shaking moments converge. First, his mission is clarified. Here on the Mount of Olives, Jesus' mission is clarified for us. Comes out of verses 6 through 8, and I will reread them. They come together and listen to the question that they have for Jesus. If you had one final question for Jesus, what do you think you would ask him? This is their last question. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? How does Jesus respond? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons feel like that's an echo from the Gospels. I already told you this, guys. The Father has fixed this by his own authority. It's none of your business when I will restore the kingdom to Israel. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Their very final question to Jesus it's a little troubling, honestly. <laughs> You're like, guys, have you not been listening? No one knows the day or the hour. They're like, yeah, but he died and rose again. Maybe we get another shot at this. No. You're not going to get to know that. Are you sure, Jesus, now that you're resurrected, maybe that will instantly, now at this moment, catapult us into these end times where Israel will be the big dog again. Where we'll be in charge. Maybe you will ascend to a throne right now, Jesus, and put down the false leaders of the church and put down Rome. Give us the political power that we have been craving for the last three years. Is it going to happen now, Jesus? It's not for you to know when that's going to happen. And not only does he say it's not for you to know when that's going to happen, he corrects their question for timing. But implicit in there is he also questions corrects their very question of what the mission was about all along. Do you see that? They're asking about Israel. They're asking about Jerusalem. They're asking about their nation. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, this is your job. This is your mission to be my witnesses to my ministry, to my message, to my life, to my death, to my resurrection. And you will start here in the center of Israel, in Jerusalem, but it is not limited to this nation. It's going to ripple out from this place. The earthquake starts here, but it's going to go from Jerusalem to Judea, the surrounding region, to Samaria. That's the region beyond that. And it doesn't stop in our region. It will go to the very end of the earth. To the very end of the earth. 
The earthquake starts here. It starts now, but it does not stop here. And you're craving for a national kingdom will be swallowed up in a global kingdom that will never end. And a king who is not bound to earth, as we'll see, but rules and reigns in heaven itself from the throne room of God. Jesus clarifies both the timing, none of your business, and the mission, which is none other than the end of the earth. The end of the earth to be Jesus' witnesses. To be a witness is to bear witness to the truth. To stand up, it's kind of this judicial language of standing up on trial. and Bearing witness to the truth under oath. So help me God, this is the truth. We are called to be witnesses for Jesus, to bear witness, to tell people about his life, his ministry, his mission, his resurrection power, the forgiveness of sins that comes in the name of Jesus. And it's interesting because Jesus clarifies for them and for us, I think very helpfully at the end of his ministry, what his mission is and what it is not. Because we are all guilty of something I would call in life and in the church, mission creep or missional creep, where everything starts to get swallowed in under the banner of mission. Jesus' mission is not political. He corrects that, doesn't he? That's not what your job is. It's not to go and overthrow Rome. Now, that inevitably happens as his kingdom expands, but that's not their job. It's not primarily humanitarian which I'm so thankful that wherever the church goes, schools and hospitals pop up. But Jesus didn't say, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will send doctors to the ends of the earth. He says, you will send witnesses to me, to the ends of the earth. It is not primarily ecological. God so loved the world. He loves our planet. He's sending us to the earth. Go green Jesus, right? Now, I think we should take care of our planet, and there's plenty of Bible verses to defend that. Here's my point, though. These are not the final parting words of Jesus. Right before I go, make sure, church, that you are busy, and the things I want you to be busy with are this, 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 all these things. Jesus says, I want you to be focused on one thing. Bear witness about me to the ends of the earth. Because it's been said and I think this is right. When everything is mission, nothing is mission. In church, we must be laser focused on the mission of Christ. In Matthew 28, he calls us together. He calls his disciples. He says, go therefore. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. That is our mission. And no other organizations will do that for us, by the way. Christians are called to serve as doctors. Christians are called to serve in humanitarian work. Christians are called to make the planet a better place. But the church with the capital C, the only thing that we can do as an organization that Jesus has commissioned us proper to do is to make disciples. And nobody else will do that. Only you and only us. This is the mission that Jesus has given to us, to make disciples and bear witness about him to the very ends of the earth. You know, a missional creep is not only in the church. It's true in any organization. I used to work for Sears in high school. Sears Logistics Services. I was like the 16-year-old kid that you would yell at when your fridge didn't come on time. <laughs> it's when I learned what the word irate meant, you know. Customers very irate. <laughs> Got used to getting screamed at doing one of these. And after working there, I'm like, I will never buy from Sears. I work for Sears, but forgive me if you love Sears. Sadly, they're closing shops everywhere. Sears lost its way somewhere along the line. It, you know, it couldn't tell if it wanted to be a Home Depot or a women's clothing store, right? It just didn't know what it was anymore. And one day, it's like, you know, you're going to get your tools at Sears, and it's like, come see the softer side of Sears. And you're like, what is this place? And all the while, it's just shutting down stores because it doesn't know why it exists. 
I contrast that with like Chick-fil-A, right? You know, like, hey, I'd like a hamburger. We don't do that. What do you do? Chicken. Really, really good. We're the best. I'm not going to start the chicken war right now. But I'm just saying, <laughs> buy Christian chicken. Chick-fil-A. No. They're blowing up. They're expanding. Why? They know why they exist, and they are passionate about it. And they are the best at that one thing. And the church of Jesus Christ must remember why we exist, and we must get great at not lots of things, but one thing, which is making disciples of Jesus Christ. That, that is why we exist, to grow in Christ and to proclaim Christ to the world. I have a little video I want to show you and just talk about how this mission here given to the early church plays into our mission as Manoa Community Church. Go ahead and throw that video up. See Philadelphia in the background there? Church, guess what? Our mission isn't primarily even in this room. Though if you don't know Jesus, if you're not a disciple, it's where we get equipped. That video intentionally shows us our vision, our mission is to fill Havertown, this community that God has based us in. Delaware County, Philadelphia, and the ends of the earth with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've literally lifted Acts 1.8 because just as the gospel makes impact in Jerusalem and ripples out from there, the gospel lands here in Havertown. We are called to be a base for gospel mission that ripples out from Havertown. Delaware County, that is our Sumeria, if you will. And Philadelphia is our Rome, if you will, to the very end of the earth. And we will be laser focused on that in the weeks, months, and years ahead. We as elders are looking at everything saying, what is not fitting into that? We're going to reevaluate all of our missions, everything, and say, how are we doing with this? How are we doing at reaching this community, Philadelphia, and unreached people groups is going to be our focus because this is not our mission to define. This has been entrusted to us by Jesus, and we will stay laser-focused on that. One more thought under this, our strategy is to equip you, to equip each one of us to share Christ and his mercy in the power of the Holy Spirit and make disciples that go and do likewise. Manoa Community Church, our mission has been given by heaven. Our mission has been given by Jesus. And we will focus on this. This is not a fad. This is not in five years we're going to rewrite our mission statement. This is the mission that will drive our mission together as a church and our mission individually as believers in Jesus Christ. And as a teaser for this summer, I will push pause on the ACT series as we go into a teaching series on personal evangelism called Three Crowns. And I will spend the whole summer investing in us to get us comfortable with sharing the gospel personally with our friends and family. That is to come. We are here, church. We are here to preach the gospel. We are here to make disciples. We are here to bear witness about Jesus. Jesus has been crystal clear. May the mission never be fuzzy or creep into other areas. So, the first earth-shaking moment here is the mission is clarified. Secondly, the ascension. The ascension is completed. The ascension is completed, verse 9. And when he, Jesus, had said these things, as they were looking on, he, Jesus, was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Holy smokes. Can you believe that? I mean, this is the climax of all climaxes. Jesus is born by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Virgin Mary, born into a stable. And here, as he returns to heaven, he is literally lifted up so much like a rocket sh shooting into the sky till you can't see him. The clouds envelop him and you say, he's gone. Jesus is gone. 
and he told us that he was going to prepare a place for us, but I mean, he really left to go prepare a place for us. Now, obviously, we don't just believe like heaven's up there and hell's down there or anything like that. Jesus clearly is enveloped back into that space of spiritual realm called heaven. However he got there, I don't have time to figure that out, all right? But Jesus isn't simply going up. He is going back to the Father. He's going back to the presence of God. Jesus' ascension is completed here. And in John's gospel, John chapter 16, he told us, and he prepared us for this. You can go back and listen to our John series. He says, it's better that I go. He says, it's to your advantage that I go. Why? How? I mean, part of me thinks I'd really like to have Jesus at this pulpit instead of me, right? Like I, but this is what he says, and it connects right back to verse 8. He says, because if I go and when I go, I will send a helper, another helper. I will send you the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. I get a hallelujah. Yes. I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will be with you and he will be in you. And this is a teaser for Pentecost that's coming in chapter 2. Because Jesus is about to inaugurate the age of the Holy Spirit from the church. And that earthquake will land in that church, in that upper room. But it will not, he will not stay there. It will reverberate through the church throughout the ages. Revival will break forth. Conversions will happen all over the globe because God is now not limiting himself inside of a human incarnate body. His power and presence has now been poured out and manifest on the whole world. Especially in the hearts of his sons and his daughters. The Spirit of God comes to his witnesses. That is the place where God's spirit is most manifest in the world, in you and in me. And it's interesting because verse 8 tells us that he would give us the Holy Spirit. And he also tells us not only that the spirit is coming, but why he would give us the Holy Spirit. Look again at verse 8. You will receive Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Now, I long for more of the Holy Spirit. I long to be filled with the Spirit. I long to experience God's power and presence, and I long for it especially to happen in church. But, my Bible does not say that the Holy Spirit's been primarily given for me to have spiritual highs and mountaintop experiences personally. I've been in context. We're going to have a Holy Spirit meeting, and I love that. And praying, and we're filled, and I've even seen people, all the manifestations of the Spirit, laying on the floor, all the things. I love, I love that. That's great. I'm not against that. Except if you get off the floor, walk out those doors, and hide your faith. No, that is not why God shows up powerfully in our lives. The reason that he fills us with his spirit is to give us power to be his witnesses. The spirit is not a hidden secret in the church. The spirit is a public, powerful demonstration and manifestation of God to the world through the church. And that's what we will see in the book of Acts. I remember as an early believer, I shared my testimony. I got saved at the end of high school. I had a powerful encounters early. I still seek, but like where I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was like, holy smokes, God, you are real. Like I remember one night, it was like a, 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 I think it was my summer after my junior year in high school, and I was up for hours praying, overwhelmed with the love of God, shaking with the fullness of the Spirit, speaking to God and experiencing communion with him in ways where I was like, I thought, I thought this was just in the Bible. I didn't know it was like real. And I, I couldn't fall asleep. I just wanted to pray. <laughs> and that's not me. Right? Like, and you know what happened next? That's what I told you in my story. I took the CDs. I was in that band. And I put my Bible in my backpack. And I started telling people about Jesus at school for the first time. I started witnessing 
And that's what the Holy Spirit will do to us in different ways. It doesn't look all the same. I, I know for me, when the Holy Spirit fills me, he always sends me to scary dudes. Now, <laughs> like in college, I was always looking for like the football team or something. I'd be like, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? You know, I was going to the frat houses where the parties were spilling out. I was like, hey, guys, do you have just a minute? Who are you? I'm Stefan from Campus Crusade for Christ. I just want to tell you about Jesus. Turn down the music. Hey, this guy wants to talk about Jesus. You, know? you guys know I moved up from Florida, and one of the things I was doing is preaching the gospel in the public schools. Why? Because you're not supposed to do that, right? So I'm like just praying, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. One time I was at a school, and they gave me the microphone in the cafeteria. And they let all the other groups do this, including the groups that are completely anti-Christian. So I said, fair enough, equal opportunity. Stood up on the table with the microphone and preached the gospel to the entire school. Five students came to Christ and I gave away a whole box of Bibles. It was awesome. Not to, I just say, it, it was glory to you, God. But power. Do you want power? Then you want the Holy Spirit. And I have the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit. That's not a question. If you're a Christian, no one becomes a Christian apart from the Holy Spirit. But one of the things we will see in the book of Acts is that people who have the Holy Spirit are dyna dynamically filled and encountered the Holy Spirit in powerful ways throughout their Christian life. In these punctuated ways where Peter will stand up filled with the Holy Spirit and preach. The Holy Spirit has been given because Jesus has ascended to the Father, and he is available for you. And if you're feeling powerless, fearful, frightened, there's a place to turn. There's a person to turn to. None other than the Holy Spirit of God himself, because Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. The ascension of Jesus means so much for us as Christians. It reverberates throughout the world endlessly. But two things I want to end on this point before we go to our third. It clearly means this. Jesus is king. When he ascended, it's like his coronation, if you will. He sat down at the right hand of the Father at the throne of God. And he is the one that pours out the Spirit. He is the one that rules and reigns. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus is king of the kingdom. And his kingdom will know no end. And his kingdom has no boundaries or jurisdictions that keep the king out. And when he sends you as an ambassador of the king, you have all authority of heaven and earth on your side. He is king. Jesus is in heaven. He's giving you the spirit. You are authorized to go. I was trying to think of illustrations. It's not like and not to throw security guards under the bus, all right? Like, but the mall security guard, they got the badge, they got everything, but you find out, it's like, oh, it's like just for the mall. Like, it's just a little small jurisdiction, you know? He doesn't even have a gun, you know? We are in the Marines. We are in the Army. And not just the Army of the United States. We are in the Army of the Lord and his jurisdiction covers the whole earth and you can go anywhere and preach Jesus because Jesus is king. And he is king whether people acknowledge it or not. Jesus has ascended. Secondly, not only do you have his authority, but you have his ear. Because Jesus has ascended to the Father, he is listening as your great high priest, the Bible says, a sympathetic one who's ready to give you help in your time of need. You don't need to go to him in Jerusalem you don't need to take a spiritual journey to Bethlehem, though if you want to do those things, awesome. Jesus can hear you right now. We'll see that in the book of Acts. We can now pray to him. We can pray in his name. We can bring all our requests to him. And when you are suffering and when you are tempted, you know this, Jesus gets it. He gets it. Because he's walked your walk. He's walked your temptations. And God is now here to help you, not only with power, but with sympathy. The ascension is completed. Thirdly and finally, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, the third earth-shaking moment is his return is confirmed. His return is confirmed. Verses 10 and 11, while they're gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? 
this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, Jesus said that. He said, I'm going away to prepare a place, and if I go away, I'll come back for you, etc. But it's still nice after the clouds envelop him that God sends like one final reminder, these two angels in white, like, hey guys, he will come back. It wasn't just Jesus saying that, and that's sufficient. God sends some ambassadors, some angels, some messengers to say, stop looking up. You have work to do. Isn't that what, he, what they say? It's interesting. They kind of correct and rebuke them gently. But, I mean, you got the, the apostle like, holy smokes, he's gone. Do you see a dot anymore? I don't see a dot anymore. It's just a cloud. I think I said, no, that's a bird. Okay. All of a sudden, these guys in white walk, you know. Yeah, what? Why are you looking up? Because Jesus just disappeared. He's coming back just the way you saw him disappear, all right? But didn't Jesus just tell you something? Yeah, he said, he said we well, got something to do. What did he tell you to do? Be his witnesses on earth. Why are you looking at heaven, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm here staring into the sky when Jesus told me I am supposed to have an impact on the earth. I got to get my eyes out of heaven Know that he's coming back. Set my eyes on the ground because I have business to do. Jesus has commissioned me to have impact on the earth, not in the sky. John Stott, in his commentary on the book of Acts, has a really helpful application to this. He says, this whole section here guards us, corrects us, adjusts us from two errors that we're all prone to in the church. Two false fantasies is what he calls them. The first is what he calls the politicist error. The politicist error is the question the disciples asked. When are we going to have more power? When are we going to have more political power? When are we going to bring the utopia into Jerusalem, right? It's this idea that through our false activism, somehow we can usher in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of earth, through our own human efforts, through our political power. Now, again, I hope there are Christians in politics, and please vote. Not what I'm saying. Here's the point. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is not bound into the United States of America. Jesus is not an American or a Texan or a whatever, Tennessean, all right? It's much larger than that. And by the way, the kingdom of God exists outside of democracy. It can exist in every form of government, monarch, Communism, wherever the kingdom of God sows, Jesus rules and reigns. Now, we should be involved in things, but we can get so preoccupied like these disciples. How do we get this perfected here? Jesus says, that's not your goal. Be my witnesses. So that's the first error. It's the politicist error. The second error is what I would call, or he calls, the pietist error. The pietist error is where we're preoccupied with the heavenly Jesus so much so that it creates a false passivity in the Christian. We just spend our times and our quiet times reading our Bibles, going to Holy Spirit meetings, falling on the ground, you know, having a good old time with Jesus. But we're not doing anything. <laughs> and we're not bearing witness to Jesus to anybody. We're just talking to our Christian holy huddle and then we go out and hide. No. He says, this is what he says. This passage shows us that what a witness is is somebody who embraced earthly responsibility and heavenly enabling. Jot that down. We embrace earthly responsibility and heavenly enabling. Jesus is in heaven, and he's commissioned us here on the earth to be his witnesses. I'm going to invite the worship band back up as we transition towards the end of the sermon, I do want to go to Matthew 24. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's a helpful way to end this passage before we transition into communion. I talked about how on the Mount of Olives there were these ripplings of earth, these tremors, if you will, 
In Matthew 24, verses 1 through 14, is part of Jesus' Olivet Discourse. This was part of what Jesus literally told these guys earlier in his ministry as they go right back and he ascends to heaven. Listen to the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the Mount of Olives. Jesus left the temple, verse 1, and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, how marvelous they were. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That should have dashed their thoughts for a glorious temple. And by the way, that happened in 70 A.D. at the fall of Jerusalem. Verse 3. And Jesus sat down on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will be. and What will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? The return of Christ that the angels told us about. Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to, the, up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. God protect us from that even now in America. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Because of lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, this global gospel, this global kingdom, this kingdom to the ends of the earth, it will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then then the end will come Maranatha come Lord Jesus there are parts of the world that have still not been reached and I've said it before and I will say it again we must send and we must go and we will and we will send our money and our people and our children and we will partner with other churches committed to finishing this because this is the earthquake this is the earth shaking this is the cataclysmic event that will end all earthquakes and the very clouds that Jesus was enveloped in, he will return like lightning across the sky and bring in the perfected kingdom of God and the resurrected of all the dead from now to the end of the age. Then every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Maranatha, Lord do it. Come.